I think I really liked the part. I mean, I, I, I think the part was, uh, it was almost Shakespearean. Didn't you love me? This was an extremely robust character. And uh, this part was, well, how could you turn this part down? I mean, David, David stands head and shoulders in his brain above so many people because although he's a brilliant filmmaker, he's a brilliant thinker. Many, many, many directors are wonderful filmmakers, but they might not have a mass between these two ears here. Cronenberg was this interesting guy, and he made these really twisted movies. What I liked about him is that they involved makeup effects, and, and the makeup effects were very important to the to the film, and I know a lot of his early films were, you know, very small budget productions. There was Rabbit that had that weird the, the <laughs> sex organ in, in, in uh, Marilyn Chandler's armpit. And then he also had Shivers, where he had that weird effect of those, like, things that, you know, crawled in the person's mouth, and, uh, and uh, Joe Belasco uh, did this weird bladder effect under an appliance for that. There was no computer-generated imaging. Uh, back in those days, there was it was all puppeteering work, and it was all just done by your knowledge of, of camera angles and how you were able to manipulate the puppeteering of the of the effects. This was the smallest of the parasites, and this design was actually sent by one of David Cronenberg's um, graphics artists. And um, it had, uh, you know, quite a bit of veins on it, and it was all wrinkled up. It has little ears and a little, little mouth at this end. So it was quite a unique design for its day. David was in his own world. David knew exactly what he wanted. Nobody else really knew what was going on in David's head. I think I came pretty close to it because I think that he was able to get through to me and I was able to understand him well enough to be able to give him the effects that he needed that made the film. And I think David had, he had the same birth pains that we all did in a, the birth of a new industry. Because up until then, films in Canada were Canadian movies. These were now kind of movies made for a world market. And David's films, to me, were always a tangent of a tangent. You know, independent horror films are now specialty horror films, and it's a David Cronenberg film. And a, we, we'd like to say it's a thinking man's horror film, but it really is. David would say, well, if you're going to watch this, you're going to have to watch it again. Or pay real close attention if you're only going to see it once. I thought that he had got the idea from hives. So these little hives are on your body, and then they become humans. This idea of a swelling on the outside of the body actually becoming a human being uh, through anger, being born out of anger and forming an army. Quite a good idea, actually, come to think of it. <laughs> As you know, the film is about his own experience with uh, a wife, an ex-wife, I should say, and an abducted daughter and trying to get her back from a cult. I, I can't imagine this ever working now getting on a plane from Toronto, flying to California, driving in a rental car, grabbing your daughter from a commune, and getting back on a plane and flying back to Canada and saying, there you go, it's that easy. Uh, but in those days, that's exactly what he did. In Canada, art is made to be uh, helped in every which way possible. Film being part of art and culture, uh, the Canadians said, to their government, you've got to help us to make movies, to compete with the big bad Americans. We've got to build industry. And one of the ways that they devised at that time was to create uh, the tax shelters. And the first one that started using them were the smart lawyers and accountants and a few very maverick producers like Garth Rubinsky and a few people who knew how to combine and get money and raise money. And you had the number of movies getting made. I think maybe one of the reasons I was cast because Canada at that time wanted English actors. They wanted, to, there was an allowance for the tax credit. And so I think that 
Oliver and I probably came under that category. At the end of the year, when the investor says, oh my God, I'm going to have that much taxes to pay, okay, I want to take a shelter. So you had that crazy December 31st closing where nobody was going anywhere else than the lawyer's office, and there were piles of documents and during hours and hours and hours and hours, everybody was signing and transferring check and transferring money. And a lot of uh, that, I think, led to uh, thinking and acting and, and shooting on the fly and, and still uh, on the run, basically, uh, and having all that in your back pocket. And I learned a lot about shooting night for day because the sun would go down so early, certainly in, in uh, December. So we would shoot scenes, daylight, and this one's against the lake. Okay, we'll shoot her close up. He's against the, the porch. Okay, we'll do that later. And we'd shoot everything truncated like that and then come back and do light night for day and make the dead of night look like uh, early morning or, or full on daytime. So I've done that a lot by, uh, and everyone says, well, how do you learn how to do that? You don't want to know. <laughs> David had worked uh, in the past with Cinepix and made with Andrew Ling and John Dunning Shivers and Rabbit. Rabbit was very successful. And for some reason, they didn't connect with the brood or something didn't go, didn't work out. So the movie was available. It was called something else at that time. It was not called The Brood. I renamed it The Brood. So um, that's how the script ended up on my desk and that started it. The Brood was quite a breakthrough for all the layers of artistry. And that's where I realized that David was part scientist, part filmmaker. Every one of his films, or virtually the ones I worked on, had a scientific through line, whether it was cycloplasmics in the brood, or whether it was a metempsychosalin from biocarbon amalgamate on scanners. He has all these things that have a scientific background, the same with the fly. And I realized a lot of them have a similar storyline to the fly, that the hero of the film is involved with something scientific that ends up being the victim of the storyline, if not the science project itself, and ultimately dies. I was working on Fantasy Island, getting married to Ricardo Montalban, who, being an actor of his time, when he kissed you, he held the back of your neck and he bent you over and kissed you, and you sort of felt that you were in the 30s, flown to Canada at 28 degrees into the brood. Four days. I shot Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I flew home to Los Angeles on Friday. So the entirety of the brood was shot in four days for me, my part. I knew I could take the risk of making a movie like that because the money was there. And the money was not very difficult on what script. I knew it was at least as good, if not better, than the majority of what was shot in Canada. And the investors just wanted a shelter for their income. They were expecting one day some money coming back, but it was, it was, it was craziness. Wow. The man is a genius. It was a time to take some chances. And I knew that at least it had enough scares and weirdness and all that, that it would, have, it would find some audience. Right from the beginning of my career, I would say to my agents, all right, oh, I've done a drama, now I'd like to do a musical. Oh, gosh, I got a musical with Rex Harrison, wow. Now I'd like to do a comedy. Oh, wow, I got a comedy with Cary Grant. And so it was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. So I'm sure, in retrospect, a horror movie was something that I hadn't tackled. And I thought, that'll be interesting. Let's do that. When David and I first worked together, it was a drag racing movie called Fast Company, set in Montana, shot in Edmonton. Claudia Jennings, Queen of the Bees, and uh, Big William Smith and John Saxon. Great cast. So we had a great time. And right after that, he, he started up on The Brood, and he invited me to shoot that. So we went from Edmonton in the summer to cloudy and kind of well, brooding weather in Toronto. Uh, when I found out that Oliver was going to be in it, I was thrilled. Oliver and I grew up in England in a place called Bledlow, Buckinghamshire, as sort of war evacuee babies. So I'd known Oliver all of my life. And we had also worked in a film called Lady in the Car, directed by Anatole Litvak. 
in the early 70s. Oliver was a wonderful soul. He really was. I mean, drink does, as we know, things to people. But he's, his, his deep soul, his, his quietude, his caring, his loving, his kindness, I experienced. I'm sure everybody's got an Oliver Reed story. But I, I know that side of Oliver. It's always great to be working with an actor that uh, you have a deeper affinity than just actors because something adds, you know, you have a history and it adds to it. I made three movies with David. We'll get the scanners. And that's a whole different animal in terms of production. The other two, Video Room the Brood, were very together. The difference with the Brood and Videodrome is the budget was infinitely smaller. So the brood had more of a commando feel, but very organized. David only had about seven in crew. We were working a la Francaise. He, he worked as they were working in France at that time. Very small group of people who we all knew each other intimately. And it was a perfect experience. Never worked like that before. I'd worked with a crew of 120 in most of the films I'd done up until that time. Here there were just seven people on the set. And it was very intellectual. I wouldn't cast somebody that looks like Cronenberg to play Cronenberg. Very, very bright. I mean, that was the thing I found intimidating about dealing with David was he, he was so much more intelligent than I was and would use words that I didn't even know what they meant and, and make these references that I would have to look up. You know, and the, um, but he is, you know, so much like this college professor, you know, a very nice family man uh, who just has the, writes the weirdest stuff, you know. Not only David, but the crew, the crew in Canada, they were all, they were all graduates of university. Some of them were PhDs holding a lamp. I honestly have a philosophy when it comes to horror films, and I've done a lot more outside of David's films, that I adhere to kind of religiously, even if it's a self-made religion. But a lot of guys will shoot, different cameramen will shoot an entire movie in shades of darkness. So the living room, dining room, kitchen, classroom are all dark and moody. Shafts of light, smoke, the whole thing. So when you finally get into the scary place in the basement or the attic or the abandoned warehouse, it's dark and moody with shafts of light and smoke. You think, well, how can you scare anybody? You have to have a norm that says, now we're going someplace dark and you turn off the lights. And now you create mystery. And if only to transport people with what they don't see and then therefore what they're afraid of, that's what brightness and darkness is all about. For me, it was very exciting. Here I was, you know, it was in many ways my first, one of my first big films. <laughs> David was always known as more blood, right? So that's where I learned uh, to carry a paper towels with me and, and be in there first to put it on the blood so it wouldn't be spread around and to help people clean up and it wouldn't get on white costumes. Remember, Samantha Eger was in a white costume and it was just a nightmare. Not because she got something on her, but the fear that she would, and we'd have to take the costume off, and I don't know that we even had a second one. My daughter was coming back to me. The process of the makeup was um, really very funny. Uh, I was lying on, I think they probably had a, a, a door that they put on a couple of trestles, and somebody put a blanket on it, and they plonked me on it, and uh, sort of covered me from here, and then all the rest of it was naked. And then they brought these condoms out and they cut the condoms and they filled the condoms with, I don't even want to know what it was. And then they glued the top of the condom and people were going, oh, I think I'll put one here. Oh, let's put one here. Oh, I'll put another one down here. And of course they were varying sizes because the pregnancy had to have some that were one month old and some that were eight months old. And of course in the birthing, in the film of the nine-month-old, that one had to be sort of big and loopy. And we were laughing so much that sometimes, I mean, my stomach, they'd have to sort of stop me because it's would say, Sam, stop laughing because the condom isn't sticking to your stomach. 
it was really not a new art because, of course, they had done big uh, films with big explosions and stuff in Hollywood, but this was Toronto and this was in the late 70s, so, so it wasn't like we had huge uh, houses that were doing this thing as we have today. It's an, just entirely different. As a matter of fact, when I look at the breakdowns that I would have to do, you know, in my schedules and how much time and so forth we thought it would take. We never knew how much time it would take. And that was the one thing about special effects. You couldn't really tell. The prosthetics on The Brood were done by a venerable Hollywood effects legend called Jack Young, who'd worked on The Wizard of Oz, Apocalypse Now, and a lot of, a lot of big films. And the, the prosthetic world, I believe, was across, crossing generations at his point which used armature wire and wax and things like that, and the new guys were using different plastics and synthetic uh, rubbers, things like that, that uh, had, a, had a different chemical composition. And the tongue is too thick and infected. I believe there's a dissection or an autopsy scene or something, and Jack, he made it all out of wax, and it was melting, and we're thinking, we have rubber, we have synthetic stuff. But, so that was kind of an eye-opener. I don't, I don't remember if he finished the film or what, but it was, that was a tough... Uh, the tough thing for David to swallow, because he was leaping and bounding ahead of everyone. Are you ready for me, Frank? Are you really? I seem to be a very special person. When I use the word Shakespearean, that's the still scene, because that was almost like sitting on a throne. It's like playing Queen Margaret or something. Uh, and uh, just all of that dialogue just in one, you know, the rage dialogue, very still. And look! And when it finally came and the expose of, of these condoms hanging off my body. I've always had animals. I've always had a minimum of seven or eight dogs and, and um, so, you know, lots of puppies and seeing the mothers always licking the babies. So I thought, well, obviously I've got to lick this blood off this. It was a doll, obviously, and I'm, I was shown how to move it with my bottom hand so that it looked like a baby. So I, I did suggest to David being a farm girl, that I lick this thing, lick it and lick it and lick it and lick all the sugar water and the red dye. And we used to have rushes in those days, dailies, and there were only men in the little theater watching them and apparently all of them almost threw up and had to go out of the door because I'm sure that <laughs> when they first they first saw that, and they saw this red stuff sort of pouring out of my mouth and on my tongue. Um, but, you see, that's the, that's the great thing about making horror movies, is that behind the scenes, we're all laughing. And, and then the poor people in the cinema are being scared to death. But we're just, we're just laughing as we're doing all these disgusting things. It's great. Special effects are like anything that's delicate. They can fail, especially as they're made for one-off. And the molds that they use, and whether they made a first mold of the face properly so that they can now make the mask that they're going to glue on. And then, of course, how often will you show it? David was very, very judicious. You didn't want to use it too often, and you didn't want to get too close. Now, of course, you can get as close as you want because the, the, the work is just so fine. But well, it was a cautious world that we were in with special effects. First of all, you didn't know if they were going to blow you up or whether the effect would work and whether the blood would go here and here. And, you you know, I mean, how often you'd throw up your hands and say, well, okay, that didn't work. Well, better, better we move on and we'll come back when you get it ready, you know? So you were always moving on and coming back. Actually, from a cinematic standpoint, once I create the, the lighting plan for the flaws or the, the deficiencies or the weaknesses of prosthetic effect, um, once we overcome that, the actor is now wearing something that's part of his character. I remember doing stuff in a, in a wrestling film where people had a black eye, and all it was was makeup, and they had their eyes open like this, and I said, you should squint like that. 
That's what swollen eyes do. That's what all this purple is. It's making you squint. If you're clear-eyed, then it looks like you're wearing paint. The same with prosthetics. And one thing that changes a lot is, is the, the bone structure and literally the flesh contours of someone's face when something's applied. So it's great to be able to shoot from a, an angle where you don't have the symmetry that says, this is normal, cut away, come back, and they have something ready to explode. Wait a minute, that's not normal. So if we're offside a little, if we can find something that feels natural and it isn't perfectly uh, what you'd expect, I can embellish a lot, but actors can, can uh, find a way that their, their body doesn't look like if they're padded or contorted in some way that they can keep it straight. Uh, we, when we did The Brood, uh, we had someone who had uh, prosthetic effects on his chin, it was, and he had uh, lymphosarcoma. Um, so he kind of played the scene, and then he revealed that this, this tumor was there. And that was great because you didn't see it coming. It wasn't like the Elephant Man thing, that it was much more subtle. And to me, that's what these prosthetic effects are for. In films, like the films that David does, that are much more cerebral than someone with a chainsaw and a hockey mask would uh, provide the pl as a plot point. David wore glasses. I always knew that we were in trouble when he would get very close to the effect and lift up his glasses so he could see it in detail because it meant that he already was sensing something was wrong. So it, it was always interesting when we were shooting, the minute he would go close like that, I realized, oh, I guess he's going to have to go back to effects makeup or whatever it is. The hero brood, broodlet, the child with his prosthetic face, was actually a midget who worked at the Royal York Hotel and was from the old school of little people who would walk around hotel lobbies saying, call for Philip Morris. Uh, so he was a little old, he was like in his 60s, but he was small of stature, so he played the brood that would accompany this little girl around. And he wore the prosthetic face because he was a grown-up. When we had the final scene with Oliver Reed into the bunkhouse to find the, the daughter, um, the broodlets were now too many to be all small people who work at the Royal York Hotel. So they recruited a group of gymnasts, a gymnast, gymnastics club, all little girls, age six, seven, something like that. And they were supposed to be ferocious broodlets who jumped out of the dark and attacked Oliver Reed. So we recruited all of their parents and then put up panels and, and curtains of duvetine to hide them and then lit it very dark pools of light. So when these kids had to attack, their parents were behind them in the dark and would kind of launch them off the bunk beds onto Oliver Reed, who kind of used them as giant puppets, and he would kind of beat them on himself to create this fighting sequence. It was, it was fun to watch, and it looks great in the movie, but it was much more horrific than funny, or than terrifying, I should say. The biggest craziness of the brood came around Oliver Reed. Art Hindle, who just worked with me uh, on a movie I just made, was very nice to work with. Samantha also. Oliver was... I had no idea what I was getting into when I hired Oliver Reed. Two days into the shoot, I had to go back to Montreal, and I get a phone call at uh, one in the morning, and I'm told that Oliver Reed is at the police station. And my production manager, who had to go there immediately, said, well, the good news is he's got all the cops in hysterics. They are all laughing like crazy with him. He made a bet after a very copious dinner and drinks at a um, Toronto pub. He made a bet that he was going to walk back to his hotel with no clothes on in October and November. So he took his clothes on and started walking in the street. So he obviously got arrested. And uh, the cops had to promise him that he would not do that again. And he promised he wouldn't do it again. But he was drunk as a skunk anyway. And like the Brits, he, like many Brits, he was really good at being drunk and being coherent. So uh, I said, oh my god. The next night, he threw his pillows and blankets from the floor of the Four Seasons to the, on the street. So I got a call from the hotel saying, we can't keep a guest that does that. He didn't mess around with me. I mean, uh, you know, he, he behaved. He behaved. So his drunken evenings were 
out of earshot so that at least one could get 12 hours of sleep. Now, here's what's interesting. He would show up on set on time yeah. and be totally great. He would get drunk at night, but where was the hangover? I don't know. He was amazing. He was funny. He was on target. He was great. He was kind. He was nice. He was everything. Alcoholics can do that. Many alcoholics, and I've worked with many of them in this business, can get to the set, know their lines, whether they're an actor, a director. It's part of the process of being an alcoholic. It doesn't, I mean, I have half a drink and I'm, but not true alcoholics. There's, that's why it's such a sad sickness. It had no effect on him at all. Word perfect, look good, yes, sir. on time. Chris, prepare Nola Carver Kelly for another session tonight, will you? Sure. Oh, and, uh... I worked with him on another film two years later, and just before he landed in Toronto, he got in a bar fight in Vermont or somewhere and got more headlines beating people up. So I, now I knew him pretty well. And I said, Ollie, what's the deal? Are you really still a rebel? You seem to be such a calm, gentle guy with us. What's it? And he said, oh, I had a, a public, publicist way back. And he told me one thing, to get your name in the paper. If you get arrested, your name's in the paper. If you're a bad boy and you get arrested, even better. The paradox of Oliver was his physical strength, physical body, and as we've seen, you know, his strength on screen, but this soft voice, Oliver, in real life, had a very soft delivery. You hit me with your fists and, and you scratched me with your nails. You, you hurt me. No, I didn't, sweetie. Mm. I think he found the intimacy of the camera very much to his personality. And I think as time went on, and the more films he did, he realized the power he had on a film screen. And how can one say he wasn't good in almost everything he did? He was. I loved my interaction with David. Very passionate, very rational. I would make all my notes on the script, and then we would systematically discuss every note. He never imposed this view. He always defended it rationally. And he expected the same from me. The brood is pretty rough. I mean, it's pretty raw, and it is the work of a young man. And as you see David's progression, you just see this richness just getting riper, really. But you see, David has never strayed from his viewpoint of, what he, of how he wants to make a film. I mean, you can always tell it's a Cronenberg film. He just got a bigger stage and more money. They killed Ruth Mayer, and then they brought Candace back here. That's the nice thing about working on Cronenberg films. It isn't a through line, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy kills girl, whatever. It's all these layers that it's slowly revelations. Oh, oh he's, oh, that, oh. And that's why it, it isn't just a story. It's kind of this unfolding of a, of a story line. And David was very adept at that in balancing performance, in location, in theme, in pacing. It's me, Nola. It's Frank. I'm totally surprised at the success of the film. Right. Only because of the awards that the collector got. I seem to be known mainly for that, or for Doolittle. But when suddenly, when people would, fans would come up with posters of The Brood, and I would go, really? I had no idea that the cult was growing and growing and growing. What's been happening to me has been just too strange. Too strange for me to share with anyone from my old life. The movie did okay. It was acquired by Roger Corman in the States. Uh, it was an incredible moment when I go to Roger Corman to cut the trailer and the guy who's helping cut the trailer is Joe Dante and the other guy running around is John Carpenter and it was like amazing and they're all respecting the work of this new guy, David Cronenberg. The movie got worldwide release, 
didn't do anything really strongly theatrically. It did okay with video that was coming because it got a second life and a third life and a fourth life and became sort of a cult movie. It was the first movie of David where he started getting really good reviews. A number of people starting to say, this guy's talented, something's happening here. 